E-A-G-L-E-S Eagles Welcome to the show, everybody. Birds 365. That, you know, that man right there. You know him. You love him. His name is John McDonald. My name, McMullen, excuse me. My yeah, name is Mark Farzetta. That's first Freudian slip of the day. Uh, scoozy. My name is Mark Farzetta sitting in today with the great John McMullen. John, how you doing, friend? I'm doing well. I, I I like I got to get amped up because Farsi's here. So uh, energy uh, personified. Maybe I, not Brandon I, Graham energy, but right yeah. underneath. <laughs> he, his I will admit his is a little bit more on the happy go lucky side. I I tend to skew happy go lucky in everything but the world of sports, un, unfortunately, yeah. which right. is which is why I guess I I, I do this. Uh, John, it's great to see you, man. It's great to to have this opportunity to to hang out with you for a couple of hours here. We're gonna get into a whole bunch of things. Uh, we're gonna get into Howie Roseman yesterday, whether or not. Yesterday's press conference with Howie and uh, Nick Sirianni was also there. People didn't seem to know that. Yeah, I tried uh, to ask Nick a question to get him involved. I got I got a Doug Peterson feel. You know, that, early yeah. in early in Nick's tenure, by the way, Mark he he made it a point to sort of take over the dais with his personality. Now he's he's got nothing to do with this, so he just sits in the back like Doug Peterson. <laughs> so I tried to get him involved. I, I like that you spread the ball around. You gotta spread the ball around, man. A lot of, yeah, a lot happy of... playing day, by the way, for Sixers fans. For uh, oh, all those people, yeah. I wasn't sure if I was able to reference it or not on Birds three sixty five. Oh, but yeah. reference whatever you want. Yeah, happy Hell, yeah. playing day for all those who celebrate. And mm -hmm, I do that... not. It's like a circus to play in. It's like I digress. You don't like the idea of playing yeah. a whole eighty two game I, season. To, to, to earn a seven seed Mark, only to play to earn the seven seed in the play in tournament. You don't like I love that idea? We, we've already gone off on a tangent. It's my fault, but I love it. I love going off on tangents. So I'll go, I, I'm I'm gonna be uh, I'm gonna confession uh you know to to father Barzetta. Um mm. I, I, I didn't know how they did the plan. I covered this league for like you know, I did like four NBA finals for a very long time before I got back to the NFL. And uh, I, I, I didn't know how it worked. I had no desire to find out how it worked. I, I, I wouldn't read about it. I'm like, this is ridiculous. What are they doing? And, and I didn't know how it worked. Now that the Sixers, I had to find out. Now I <laughs> um, yeah, I Yeah, it's a joke. It's yeah. ridiculous. I can all, so I guess I won't ask you about the in season tournament then because I think I know how you oh, feel about that's, that. That's even... <laughs> all right, we, we won't go into the weeds too much yeah. with that. But, uh, John, when, when, when you think about the press conference yesterday, one of the things I want to ask you about is uh, if it swayed you in one direction or another, if it encouraged your previous feeling, or if it made you go another direction as to where the Eagles are going in the draft. I want to get into that with you. I obviously want to get into the question that Howie Rosen was asked about the Asan Reddick question because he was asked two questions about Hassan Reddick. One, he answered with win-win. The other, he answered with, if I'm reading between the surely, lines. Surely, how dare, how dare you how ask me? You. How dare or, you or ask Dave, me? Dave, Dave, you ram. Fair question, <laughs> by the way. Mm. I've seen how he gets her. How he's usually very, you know, he's got a lot of experience at this type of stuff, so he usually fends off things pretty easily. But he, I, I've seen him now as he's getting a little bit older, like myself. He's getting a little bit surly at it times last year it was after they drafted jalen carter and it was our buddy reuben frank who i also depended asking about the you know the concerns the off the field concerns which were completely freaking legitimate at the time there's a reason he went number nine and not number one two or three because i was solely because of those off the field concerns and howie and nick kind of ganged up on reuben and basically said how dare you uh and this is a man a, a young man greatest moment of his life that kind of crap like we're there to make this best yeah you know, we're we're there to ask you questions the adversarial relationship it's supposed to be to ask you legitimate questions not make sure jalen carter's having a good day so i defended uh reuben frank and i'll defend dave here perfectly legitimate question but this time i will say and by the way howie and nick apologized to ruben because they knew they were 
fucking wrong. And I can say fucking on YouTube. But um, yeah, with, with, with Dave's question, completely legitimate. I will say I get Howie's frustration. I, I do because I, I get frustrated trying to explain. Every move isn't about one thing. There's a whole butterfly effect situation. Like there's about 70 different things that come off and everybody wants to boil it down to one thing. And that, and that's what Dave did. Perfect. As I said, legitimate question, but I get how he's frustration as well. He's like, dude, do you have an hour and a half? And uh, maybe I can explain the roster building process. So I get both sides of that one. Um, and there's a million different reasons why they went in a different direction. And if one of them didn't come into place, like say Bryce Hub signed somewhere else, or the Eagles didn't believe in Nolan Smith and Hassan Reddick wasn't about to turn 30 and Hassan Reddick didn't want $24 million and nobody was willing to give up a day two pick three years down the road, even, um, a bunch of different things. And and about 15 more. We only got two hours on this show. But everybody boils it down to, well, this move is a bad move. And that's how you make mistakes if you boil things down to one little thing and then you go to the next thing. And that's sort of the draft as well. NFL GMs get caught up in, right? If you got seven picks, Mark, you're going to get judged seven times. If you got 13 picks, you're going to get judged 13 times. And as a GM, you got to be disciplined and knock out that noise because the people that do that, to be perfectly honest, have no idea what they're talking about. So it, it, I get the frustration, but hey, that's your gig. You got to handle it better, Howie. No, I, I agree. And I agree also with what you're saying about the um, situation there with uh, Dave Uram and the question that he asked. And I've known Dave literally since the day before his first day in the media. So I've known Dave a long time. I can still remember him walking to my office at WIP with a stack of resumes. And I'm like, dude, you only need one. But anyway, um, <laughs> Dave asked a totally legitimate question. I also yeah. get both sides as you do. A uh, couple of things on it. One, there is the, the, the feeling you get as a reporter asking a question that the subject takes issue with. I don't know if you share the same sentiment as I do, but when that happens in situations that I've been in where I've asked a question and Andy Reid would do this to me, um, where it's like he looks at you and he know you know he doesn't like the question, and then he asks you a question in return, and you're like, We're really doing this, this is what we're doing now. It's a legit question, just answer the question. So yeah. I get the question from Dave. Dave asked again, what's the return? I said, What's the positive? What's the upside of the if you're Howie Roseman and you don't like that question, you don't like being asked to really boil it down to why make this trade, which is essentially what the question was. If you're Howie Roseman, you just say, well, we get a pick back in return. You don't play, you don't be coy. You don't no. play dumb and be like, well, it's not a conditional. We're getting a pick. No, like, Howie, do I now have to explain to you what a conditional pick is? Because that's the position you just put me in if you're the reporter. Oh, well, we're getting get a pick. You, we're getting yeah, we're, a pick. We're getting yeah, a pick. Yeah. It's not conditional as to whether yeah. or not. No, I understand you didn't cut Hassan Reddick. But does Hassan Reddick not being on this football team next year make you a better football team next year, especially if you're play if he's playing under the same contract, which as of right now he is with the New York Jets? So I get both sides of it. But for me, I understand and I think the reason how he got surly is because he was asked a question that made him defend the trade. Because you're not better. You're not a better football team now without Hassan Reddick uh, than you were with Hassan Reddick going into this season. I think that's why he took issue with it. it you know, I, I'm I'm going to go even. He, he took issue with it because he doesn't know Dave that well. Okay. I thought that how, might have something how, to do with how, that. How he plays favorites. I'm, I'm going to be honest. And if it were asked by a different person, it would have been a different answer. And he's a dick sometimes. <laughs> Just, I, I'm in that. I'm not in the, in the camp of uh, the, the chosen few. And he can be a dick sometimes to certain people. And he was a dick sometimes because he, Dave's not in the chosen few. Um, now, I'll say that to Howie, and I'll say that to his face. I don't give a shit. He's a dick. And if somebody else answered the question, he would have answered it differently. And he felt like being a dick. Gotcha. Yeah, no, it, it certainly looked like he uh, 
took exception to it. Now, moving on from that subject, I have to ask you about this because I I wasn't swayed one way or another. If anything, it made me feel a little bit more like the Eagles are leaning towards an offensive lineman in the first round of the draft. What they'll use that twenty second. Okay, all right. So I'm going to say this: whether they trade up or not, I don't know. But when you talk about the twenty second overall pick, what they're going to do with their first round selection, whether they move up to 19, move back to 25, whatever, what they're going to do with that pick is go after an offensive lineman. Are you swayed one way or another after yesterday, after 34 minutes of a press conference, John McMullen, are you swayed one way or another as to what the Eagles are going to do in the first round? No. Um, You know, Howie's very good as I just call him a dick. I'll also, you know, be fair and say he's a great GM. He's not going to give you a lot. Uh, so I, I build on the foundation of what he's done in the past. Um, and look, he, we all know his foundational principles. He's very honest about that. And offensive line is one of them. And then you look at this particular draft and you see where's the deepest and it lines up offensive line. Um, and you start talking about whether you think there should be seven or eight, um, um, most of them offensive tackles go in the first round uh, versus any other position. It's far, far deeper there than anywhere else. So in theory, especially when you have so many quarterbacks going, and there might be five, potentially even six because of all the quarterback desperate teams, I I don't think. But I think five are going to go before the Eagles select. And all five of them don't belong in that category. Um, that means good players are getting pushed down the board a little bit. And that means there's more of an opportunity for one of these offensive linemen to fall. So if you're playing the odds, I've, I've went offensive line from the start. Now, while I say that, Mark, they're, they're probably not going to like all seven or eight of those guys. There's always, you know, you, it's not just, all right, there's eight good offensive linemen. We'll take the eighth best offensive lineman. You may not like him. How he an- answered a question about the depth of the draft, and he's and he answered that uh, uh, very eloquently. Again, look at the questioner. Um, and and one of the things he said was basically, "Well, tell me who we get. If if there's a player we like at that particular position, it's a deep draft to us." I don't give a crap about everybody else, which is the way to do it. Um, So I, I, you know, he's not going to like all eight of them. And his recent history says, whether it's Devontae Smith, Jordan Davis, Jalen Carter targeted trade up. So he's going to have a cloud, a group, whatever you want to call it, of four or five prospects that he hopes falls to 22. And if it gets down to that last one, he's probably going to try to trade up um, and and try to target that particular player. Um, but if you're playing the odds, if you're a betting man, yeah, I would I would always go offensive, defensive line, defensive front, I'll call it now, because it includes edge rushers. But that's always first on the list. Always, always, always. One of the things I was talking about on my show earlier today was the – you know, a lot of times you can look at press conferences, especially ones that are 34 minutes long, and you'd be like, well, what do they even say in this? And they're, they're not going to answer questions yes or no or tell you, of course, that they're going to, oh, we're absolutely targeting offensive line. That's that, and that's where we're going to be, or we definitely want to go corner in the first round. That's not going to come out. But sometimes in the way they explain an answer kind of lets you know how they're thinking, and it is a window into their mindset. And although we know, as you so eloquently pointed out, that offensive line in the trenches is the way they like to go – when they were asked about a replacement, I think it was Jimmy Kemsky that asked the question about moving on from Lane Johnson eventually and maybe taking a pick and weighing the pros and cons of taking a guy that you kind of stash down on the depth chart for a while to groom them and have them come along, similar to the way you did with Cam Jurgens. How do you weigh the pros and cons of that? And Jimmy actually never mentioned Cam Jurgens, but Howie took it in that direction. And I thought it was actually a really good point that he made because yeah, you when you draft in the first round, you want to guy, have a guy that's going to be a starter on your team. Want to have that guy be a home run hitter for you, whether that be offense or defense. But what they did with Cam Jurgens was an interesting thing because it allowed them to show Cam Jurgens what it takes to be successful 
in the NFL, what it takes to be successful with Jeff Stoutland and this offensive line. Because he said, instead of saying, oh, telling a first round pick, you should have been here when Jason Kelsey was here. You should have seen the way he went about his business or on the defensive line. You should have been here when Fletcher Cox was here and see how he went about his business. No, no, those guys were here. Jordan Davis, Jalen Carter, they're here. Cam Jurgens, they were here to watch those pros and definitely one, a Hall of Famer, another one, maybe a Hall of Famer in Fletcher Cox, probably a Hall of Famer in Fletcher Cox. You saw them firsthand. You're not just hearing stories about it. You not only saw it, but you got to learn from them directly and pick their brain a little bit. So that got me thinking even more so along the lines of them drafting someone that could be Lane Johnson's replacement down the line if Lane does decide to hang it up within the next year or two or three, where they can have somebody sitting there on the bench where they need the depth anyway. Because right now you're looking at, what, Matt Hennessy as a guy to be there as a swing guy from the center to guard position. Yeah. But when you talk about the tackle position, who's the guy you have confidence in stepping up, taking over if it has to be for an extended period of time? You don't have that guy right now. So to have that guy on the depth chart and also look at them as someone that could uh, go down the line and be that replacement to Lane Johnson and learn from Lane Johnson, you want to get that process started as soon as possible, especially when it's already your general philosophy. Yeah, well, you're not the only one who took it that way. In fact, when I was walking back after the press conference, somebody said basically, all right, Tyler Guyton's the guy. So he <laughs> focused in on that uh, uh, part of the conversation as well. So um, I get why certain people are going to say that uh, and, and see that um, and uncover that. But I still go back more towards it's a match this year because of the depth at the particular position. Not that they're looking for Lane Johnson's eventual replacement, I guess I'll say it. So in other words, if there weren't great, if this weren't a deep offensive line draft, then there were a typical year and all the tackles usually are off the board. All the worthy ones are off the board pretty early in the process and, you know, maybe you're down to that second level, second, second round, third round group. And if anything, you'd prefer to trade down, but the Eagles it, look and how he said this as well. And it's true. And that's what he does in free agency. He tries to draft proof the roster. And I say it all the time on this show, Mark, and I've said it, I think, every day this week, and people are sick of hearing it, and I'm going to say it again. Need is the worst talent evaluator in sports. So if you're drafting for need, if you're drafting saying, well, we got to get this started, we got to get a replacement for Lane Johnson, you're probably going to make a mistake. I think it's more about the depth at that particular position in this draft and the Eagles' foundational philosophy, and that happens to align this year doesn't always align and he's still draft proof. Then you mentioned, well, who's there? Well, Tyler Steen is there and, you know, people now think of him as a guard. Well, he played tackle strictly in college. He played right tackle more than he played left tackle. He was a right tackle at Vanderbilt, moved to left tackle at, at, at Alabama. So you have him, you have Fred Johnson, who they signed to a multi-year deer. So these are not, don't get me wrong. If Lane Johnson gets hurt, you're screwed. But guess what? You're screwed with Jack Driscoll. You can't replace people like Lane Johnson. He's just, he's a Hall of Fame player. We talked about it with Jason Kelsey, Fletcher Cox, still playing at an all-pro level. You know you're going to take a hit. Um, but you draft proof the roster enough to say where, I don't have to go get Lane Johnson's replacement right now. If the board falls the way I don't like, I can go in a different direction. And, and that's what Howie's very good at. Gotcha. All right, coming up, we're going to pick the brain of Ed Kratz coming up in just a second. We'll break down this uh, Eagles press conference from yesterday. I'll to also talk about that depth chart and whether or not Ed is also leaning in the direction of offensive lineman if he had to make his prediction, asking for a prediction, not his desire as to what the Eagles could be doing in the upcoming draft. We'll be back in a second here on Birds 365.
Imagine for a moment that you went to work today and when you came home, you were catastrophically injured. Your life and your family's life. That's what happened to union construction worker Mike Little. I was scared of what the end was going to be, but to be 100% honest with you, I knew I was going to be all right just by talking with Brian in my heart. I just knew everything was going to be all right. Call the firm and find out why they say, we got this. Call 215-458-2222. Field of life. First Trust Bank is there for you. Champions on three. One, two, three. Because Philadelphia dreams deserve a Philadelphia bank. Underdog Fantasy is the easiest place to play fantasy sports and certainly the easiest when you're watching the NBA and the NBA playoffs are almost here and you can win money making picks. What are you waiting for? Sign up on underdogfantasy.com and use the promo code WIN. An underdog will double your first deposit up to $100. That's underdogfantasy.com. Use the promo code WIN. Get ready for the NBA and get ready for the NBA playoffs. Go to underdogfantasy.com. Use the promo code WIN. Hi everybody, my name is Jason Lombardi. I'm an inspector at DryTech. At DryTech we offer three major services. The first one being basement waterproofing. The second service we offer is foundation and structural repairs. And then the third service that we offer is mold remediation. If you feel you are having a waterproofing issue, give DryTech a call or check us out online. Do you stream on a Roku, Fire Stick, Google TV, or Apple TV? Now you can watch 6ABC 24-7 with the 6ABC Philadelphia streaming app. For the big story on Action News. Search 6ABC Philadelphia and start streaming today. E-A-G-L-E-S. Eagles. Welcome back, Birds 365. Mark Farzetta, John McMullen, and joining us right now, SI.com. Ed Kratz joins us. What's going on, Ed? How you doing? Hey, uh, Mark. How's it going, John? Good morning to you. Good morning, Ed. I just sent you a not safe for work uh, text. I was hoping I'd get you to laugh on, on air, but maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> Please show the camera, Ed. No, no all right. I do uh, not. <laughs> can't, can't do that. I, here. I, I was... <laughs> All right, yeah. So uh, yeah, moving, moving right along here, uh, draft in what eight days, yeah. <laughs> seven days, something like that. So right, week, right, yeah, lots of day. Yeah, here we there, are. There we go. And I, I, I got to ask this: uh, when you talk about a, a nice long press conference like you get yesterday with Nick Sirianni, uh, with uh, the, the, the Howie Roseman fella, when you look at and listen to everything, did, did it have you swayed any way to thinking where the Eagles are going to go with that? 22nd overall pick with that asset, whether they move up or down, whatever, where are they going? Did it sway you in any direction? Yeah. Uh, you know, that Howie Roseman fella seemed to indicate to me, and I walked out of there after the conference press conference and, and said to John, I, I think you're taking Tyler Guyton. Yeah. <laughs> um, <There we> <laughs> I know, just mentioned that. I, di I didn't mention it was you, but yeah, I said, yeah. this Mark had the same thought. Oh, uh, really? Well, that that's, yeah. You know, great minds, right? Yeah. Um, but that's kind of my impression is, you know, listen, the Eagles drafted Cam Jurgens after Jason Kelsey sort of gave him a glowing review. And, of course, Kelsey had enough cachet uh, in that building to, you know, offer that sort of opinion. And the Eagles bought it. So I think they might do the same with Lane Johnson. I mean, Lane Johnson and Tyler Guyton, I mean, Johnson's Guyton's mentor. They both went to the University of Oklahoma they're close. Um, Howie and Nick both talked about the ability to bring in a young player to pick the brain, so to speak, of a, of an, a veteran player, kind of like Cameron Jurgens did with Kelsey. Jalen Carter and Jordan Davis did with Fletcher Cox. So to me, they're going to probably bring in a guy who's going to pick the brain of Lane Johnson to eventually take over his job. Now, you could say 
you would rather have a player that can kind of play guard while you're developing him to become the right tackle because you're going to draft uh, this project or whatever you want to call him in Tyler Guyton, and he's probably going to sit for two years. I mean, Lane Johnson <clears throat> is still a Pro Bowl player. The problem is, is he's been getting hurt a little bit these last couple of years, so uh, you know, you could probably plug in Guyton if he does get hurt, but you might want to have somebody that can play guard and be able to swing out to tackle uh, in two years or three years when Lane Johnson uh, hangs it up. And to me, that player would probably be like a J.C. Latham uh, out of the University of Alabama. He's a big, strong guy you can put right in the interior there, uh, but can swing out to tackle when that time comes. If, if, you know, he's not won the job at guard. I mean, we saw Landon Dickerson was supposed to be the center when they drafted him, and he made such a home at left guard. They're keeping him there. At least I think they're keeping him there. I think Jurgens is going to be the center on yeah. this team. Unless you're um, Bob, but, unless you're Bob Groats, uh, who thinks, even though Jordan Mailata told us, laughed and said, yeah, uh, Landon's staying at left guard. Yeah. They, don't want to me- they don't want to mess with Jordan and Landon Dickerson. But how he did, Ed, Get a little, a couple times got a little bit surly. We were talking about Dave's question with Hassan Reddick, which was very fair. We'll get into that and how he got surly about it. But um, he also doesn't like the thought when people say they redshirt people. Uh, and he brought up Landon Dickerson because Landon wasn't supposed to play, but Brandon Brooks got hurt and then Isaac got hurt and he ended up playing essentially the whole season. And they were off and running with Landon Dickerson. Cam Jurgens, on the other hand, um, nobody got hurt. And he did sort of red shirt. And how he mentioned, that's probably an indication things are going really well. But you always have to get guys ready to play. So from that perspective, I would think they'd rather have Latham, as you mentioned, for that reason, could probably start him at right guard. Then yes. Guyton, who's probably strictly a right tackle. Yeah, well, I agree. The problem is, is I'm not sure Latham's going to be there uh, at 22. So, you know, Howie's going to have to do what Howie always does, and that's trade up a few spots. I mean, he's traded up in, I think, four of the last five drafts. Um, so, sure, if he can find a trade partner, maybe the Rams at 19. Um, there's talk that the Bengals could take Latham at 18, so maybe you have to get ahead of the Bengals. Uh, if you really want J.C. Latham. Um, but, yeah, to me, he makes the most sense. And, you know, maybe even Graham Barton. Uh, I love Graham Barton. He, I'm on he, the Graham Barton train. <laughs> I ran that past Zach, Zach Berman, yesterday, and he snickered at me, basically. Thanks, Zach. But <laughs> Are you sure that was Graham Barton that he was snickering about, your opinion? Or maybe, you know, you had something in your mustache yeah, there? Possibly. A little, little possibly. piece of food or something? No, well, well, the thought is how he's not <laughs> taking an interior offensive lineman, which I get he probably isn't. But if you trade down, you know, yes. why not? Why not? Yeah. I, I, That guy, to me, is one of the safest picks in the draft, and he's like day one starter right guard. Absolutely. Love his size. Love his – he's 6'5", 315. I mean, that's perfect guard size. And, and, you know, we talk about drafting someone that can come in and play guard early and then flop out to right tackle. There's no guarantee that if this, per, this player comes in and wins this right guard job – that he's going to get moved to right tackle. They still have time to bring in uh, Lane Johnson's yeah. eventual replacement uh, if this player excels at guard. And, you know, Barton is an interior player. I don't think he can play tackle at the NFL level, but maybe. I just don't think he's got the weight uh, at this point. I think he'd have to add, you know, maybe 10 pounds, uh, which he probably could do. Um, but I, I just think that, yeah, he's a ready-made player. Trade down if you have to. And another trade down candidate, I think, would be a Cooper De- DeGene. I mean, they haven't uh, – you know, I, I love Cooper DeGene. I think he's a good player. Uh, I think he'd be a great fit for this team for a lot of teams. Um, but I think he could be someone, if how he does trade down, that maybe keep an eye on that that spot, that cornerback spot with Latham, maybe Kool-Aid McKinstry if he's still there. I mean, McKinstry's an interesting cat. He's kind of been mocked all over the board, you know, early well, second he's round. Medi- he's got the medical issue. So you never yeah. know if the if the medical people get involved and say, We can't, we can't take this kid. But it's impressive. You can run a I think he ran a four four seven with a Jones fracture in his foot. So maybe and, yeah. You know, 
That's and Cooper DeGene's fun. got the, you know, he's coming off of the, uh, what, the tibula fracture or yeah. something in the leg. Yeah. And, you know, he participated in his pro day. But, listen, the Eagles do their work on the medical. They drafted Dickerson, who was coming off a, you know, a torn ACL, his second one, I think, um, yep. late one. in this last season at Alabama. So they drafted him, and he's held up just fine. Um, so they'll do their homework, and if there's any red flags, they won't take him. But, you know, as far as we can tell, McKinstry and DeGene are, are re ready to go. See, I, I, one thing I, I will say is that I think they will take them just in the second round. When you talk about the injuries with cornerbacks in yeah. particular, yeah. They, this is, oh, well, you know, we got an injury with a cornerback. That means we could get them yeah. in the second round. We could still get value. And I'm not saying this is the outcome I want, but it's the Sidney Jones philosophy of, oh, top-tier yeah. talent. But well, you're negative, Mark. See, <laughs> how we want to land a Dickerson, you want to Sidney Jones. Right. So no, I understand. It doesn't always work out. I'm just talking works. about the cornerback yeah. position, for yeah. instance. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. And Sidney's situation was different, right? He tore the Achilles yeah. his pro in yeah. March, you know, yeah, and you knew day. that he wasn't going to be ready to go anytime before December, if then. Uh, I think he came back and played the last regular season game. But you, you knew you were getting a guy that you were absolutely going to have to medically redshirt. Uh, yeah. It would be different with the Gene and McKinstry. I think these guys are, are ready to go day mm -hmm. one. Uh, when when you do look at the offensive line, just to look at that again, yeah. when you look at the depth chart, and the, the, the philosophy of drafting Lane Johnson's replacement now really doesn't makes sense to me because you don't know what could fall on your lap over the next two, three seasons. And absolutely, I don't think the Eagles are going to be a horrible football team where they're going to have a top tier pick in the very near future. So looking at Lane's replacement re replacement now doesn't make a lot of sense for a couple of reasons. One, he's still playing at an incredible level. Mm -hmm. and, and and two, you're going to be good. This football team is going to be good. So why would I make that investment now, especially if Lane Johnson's career he wants to go for another three, four years playing for the Philadelphia Eagles, which is very possible. So even entertaining that idea seems odd to me. So looking at the depth chart now for this Eagles team, we know they need depth, but as of their front five, their starting five, what do you make of it with the idea of who's going to be your right guard? Will it be Matt Hennessy? Will it be Tyler Steen? I think we all agree we're looking at Cam Jurgens as the center. But when you look at that right guard spot, who do you think is the favorite to take over that position? Yeah, right now it's probably uh, Matt Hennessy, I would say. I mean, I, I think Hennessy was pretty good down in Atlanta. Now, I, he missed all of last year with an injury, um, you know, so there's going to be some, you know, build-up time, ramp-up time for him to kind of get back uh, into NFL conditioning. But, yeah, that's what OTAs and training camp and, you know, all that stuff is for, and he'll get there. And I and I think, you know, there, there didn't seem to be a lot of uh, – I don't want to say love, but there just didn't seem to be a, a level of, hey, we're committed to Tyler Steen to start at right guard. It was when they talked, when Nick Sirianni was talked to at the breakfast uh, for the coaches down at the owners' meetings, he's just, you know, he likes him, I think, as a reserve player. I think they think he can kind of be, you know, that top reserve, kind of like, you know, Jack Driscoll and Sua Opeta were. And, you know, let's remember the Eagles lost three guys on this offensive line and they've really only brought in one guy to uh you know restock the cupboard if you will um so i think they're going to come out and they're going to get somebody on that o-line whether it's lane johnson's ultimate replacement i don't know but I, i'm with you though mark i think you know why worry about replacing johnson now in 2024 when he could play another three years um the concern always though with lane is the injuries you know he seems to get banged up you know, from time to time, he's 34 years old. He's, you know, eventually going to be replaced. We don't know when that is. Uh, the Eagles were drafting Kelsey's replacement for years. I mean, yeah. Isaac oh, Ciro, yeah. then Landon Isaac Dickerson. Was the first heir apparent. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I you know, they could take a swing at Tyler Guyton, but I think it makes more sense, like I said, and we, I think we agree, is to get somebody that can play guard and, if need be, flop out to Johnson's right tackle spot in two years. And you're yeah. picking Johnson's brain. They gave Kelsey kind of that respect to bring in his replacement. Maybe they do the same with Lane, show him that kind of respect and bring in his bring in his ultimate replacement, somebody he signs off on. So that's why I could see them going with Guyton in this draft. By the way, I think it, people really turn the page quickly now. And everybody's like, oh, Tyler Steen. Uh, they can't get – I mean, I, I think they still value Tyler Steen, even if it comes into – you know, he played right tackle for years at Vanderbilt before he transferred 
uh, to Alabama and played left tackle. Now the Eagles have started him at guard. So he might turn into that versatile backup piece and be able to slide in at guard or tackle like Jack Driscoll was. So, yeah, I'm surprised how quickly, and Nolan Smith even more so. People are like, oh, no, Nolan Smith. Um, and Nolan will lead me into that segue of uh, how we surly answer uh, to Dave Ram's question about the Hassan Reddick trade. Look, I, I, I got it from both ends. It was a legitimate question. Nothing wrong with that question. And I get Howie's frustration because everybody wants to co- compartmentalize every move. And that's probably frustrating for a GM. Howie's been doing this for a long time, Ed. He's got to handle that better, doesn't he? Yeah, you would think he would handle that better. Um, yeah, I, I thought it was kind of a snippy answer. But I, you know, I thought that the question might have been a little bit, I don't know, maybe he kind of felt like he was attacked by that question. I don't know. And maybe that felt made him feel a little bit uncomfortable. Um, when he really shouldn't, he's the most, should be the most comfortable GM yeah. in the NFL. I mean, he, he's got, you know, the get out of jail free card for however long Jeffrey Lurie continues to oversee this franchise. And who knows how much longer that will be. I know it's a topic for another time, but you know, you don't know when Julian Lurie, his son takes over what that relationship with Howie will, will be. Will he be as tight uh, with Julian uh, as Howie is with Jeffrey? I, I don't know, but that's a talk for another time, I guess. But um yeah, I thought he I, I thought he should have handled it better, just answered it as professionally as possible. He didn't have to kind of chirp back. But listen, I mean, if he felt like he, he was attacked, then that's how he lashed out. I thought the question was maybe better phrased a little later. I think it was Ruben Frank who said, listen, you do have this luxury of being a general manager who's comfortable with his job. And are you does that make you feel comfortable kind of balancing trading someone like Hassan Reddick for a pick in 2026 where a lot of GMs, you know, they have to make moves for the here and now because yeah, there's Joe no Douglas. guarantee they will be, be here after the season, right? Yeah. We, we know how we will be. So he can afford to look down the road at 2026. And that probably should have been his answer is, you know, Hey, you know, I feel comfortable. That- well, how he hates to admit that. And I don't yeah. know why. Like well, we all know it. I mean, yeah. it's not, there's nothing wrong with it. And I do think, you know, Ruben kind of coaxed him a little bit by saying, look, Jeffrey really trusts you. So it's a compliment, you know, essentially. Yeah. You have more job security than, say, Joe Douglas, who's got to make moves now to win right now. Right. And that's why Hassan Reddick's with the Jets. And you can take it. I don't understand why he's got trouble admitting that. It's actually a positive for him because yeah. he's earned that right. Right. I, you know, I can see his side, though. And, you know, listen, the minute you start feeling comfortable is the minute, you know, the next thing you know, the piano's falling on your head, you know. So, <laughs> you know, you can't. I mean, he, I'm sure he feels comfortable, but I don't think he can come out and say, yeah, you know, hey, I got kind of a lifetime job here. I mean, you can't really say that. That would be a better answer. I'm, yeah. I'm here for a lifetime. I can do whatever I want. What are you kidding me? Yeah. You never know. With yeah, Julian, you never know. You know uh, with Julian, you know, that's Jeffrey, right. Jeffrey is in very good shape for his age and looks very good, but he's getting older. He's past 70. Uh, he's not going to be around forever. Um, and Julian might, you know, might like somebody else. Huh? Yeah. I don't, I don't know what the relationship is with Julian and Howie. It, you know, is it on par with Jeffrey and Howie? I, I don't know. And how much does it matter? I mean, Again, I don't know. I mean, these are all questions that we'll have to ask at some wow. point yeah. uh, sooner, probably rather than later. Well, one is my son. The other won me a Super Bowl two years after Chip Kelly. Jeez, who do I love more? No. Um, <laughs> By the way, that's a no-brainer, the GM that got you the Super Bowl. <laughs> that's the Chip Kelly, right? Um, right. All right. I, 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 what is, so away from offensive line, let's just live in a fantasy world where we think they might take someone who's not. Um uh, an offensive lineman there at 22 or with that 21st or 22nd overall pick. If they were going to go, uh, let's say, so we talked about corner a little bit there with, uh, with Cooper to Gene, Cooper to John, whatever. And he goes out there and he doesn't take an offensive lineman. Is there a, a, a player that you feel will be that kind of sexy name, that splash player that like, it's hard to get excited about an offensive lineman that might play. Is there somebody you think in this draft that there's still a likelihood, a little bit of an opportunity there for the Eagles that they would actually take with that 22nd overall asset, whether that be an edge rusher, linebacker. Is there another player out there that you would you could see the Eagles 
going after? Yeah, you know, for years I'd love to see a linebacker, you know, and Patrick Queen was coming out. Hey, take Patrick Queen. I mean, Kenneth Murray, everybody loved Kenneth Murray. Now his career hasn't gone the way, you know, I think the Chargers, or I think it was the Chargers who took him would have hoped. Um, I would love to see a linebacker, but, I, you know, Edger and Cooper, everybody seems to love Edger and Cooper. Um, will he be there at pick 50 for the Eagles? I'm not so sure. Peyton Wilson has the medical issue. You know, again, we talked about how concerning that can be. Um, but, you know, when you talk about sexy pick, it's, you know, how about a receiver? You know, we're not talking about receivers because the Eagles are paying two very good receivers top end money with A.J. Brown and Devontae Smith. Um, but they still don't have really, in my opinion, anybody. I know they signed, you know, Parker and uh Paris Campbell here as free agents, one-year deals, no real long-term commitment. Um, you know, they have Britton Covey, who hasn't seen more than a handful of snaps at receiver. Um, but they still need to address, I think, that position and, and, you know, start to bring someone along, someone to pick the brain, like we talked about with the Kelsey and Cox being the guys whose brains were picked. Bring in a receiver and and let him pick Devontae's brain and, and A.J. Brown's brain. And we don't know the future of A.J. Brown. You hope that they can come to some sort of a restructure uh, after this season, the Eagles and him, because his cap hit is about to hit the roof at $26 million next year, $41 million in 2026. So, you know, those are, aren't sustainable numbers. You're going to have to redo something. Um, what will they do? Can they figure it out? I mean, the Devontae Smith's cap charge is ridiculously uh, low. It's uh, unbelievable. It year. is I, unbelievable. Yeah, Howie Roseman is just a wizard with this stuff. He uh, really is. See, um, I, I ripped Howie early in the show, but I, I've also, and basically the Eagles will focus on my ripping of Howie, I've also called him the best GM in the NFL. And the way he gets these contracts done, yeah, um, it's unbelievable. Yeah. It is unbelievable. Believable. Yeah. We're all but talking he, about can you pay two wide receivers $25 million? He's laughing. He's laughing yeah. in the background. These idiot teams are worried <laughs> that the Vikings can't sign Jefferson. The Bengals can't sign Chates. The 49ers can't sign Brandon Ayuk. The Cowboys have to work out something with CD. Yeah. On and on and on and on. By the time Devontae Smith makes $25 million a year, which will be 2026. He will be so grossly underpaid. It will look like the best deal in the history of wide receivers. Yeah, I agree. But to answer your question, Mark, I think receiver is a sexy pick. I don't think they'll go receiver in the first round. Um, but, geez, I mean, if Brian Thomas or someone they really like is sitting there, maybe um, – they could jump in the second round. You know, someone told me that if, you know, it's, this is a, such a class that it, it, this this class is so deep in offensive tackles and wide receivers yeah. that if you really need one of those two positions, this is the draft to make sure you get them. And you have to probably get them early. So, um, you know, it could be kind of a sneaky need for the Eagles, the receiver spot that no one is talking about now that, you know, they've got two of the best in the game locked down for the next couple of seasons. Um, but again, if you're playing on that model that Howie talked about, bring in the young guy to pick the veteran's brain, certainly receiver makes sense. Um, it just came down. Jalen Hurts is going to speak today, Ed Kratz. Mm. Um, uh, now, along with Sixers playing day, that, that makes it a bigger day. Jalen Hurts is going to talk for the first time. Ed Kratz, what's the first question you want to ask Jalen? Is it about Kellen Moore, Doug Mossmeyer? Is it about his offseason? Do you want to rechurn what the hell went on at the end of last season? What went wrong? Jalen kind of goes under the radar because there's been so many other splashy stories. We're talking about the draft, um, Saquon Barkley coming in, Hassan Reddick getting traded. And Jalen Hurts is just a flat line, uh, but he's got to bounce back. And, and, and to me, the Eagles are a significant Super Bowl contender if Jalen Hurts plays like he did in 2022. If he plays like he did at the end of last season, I don't care about Saquon Barkley. I don't care about Bryce Huff. I don't care even if he has 15 sacks. They're not going to be a Super Bowl contender. What do you want to ask Jalen Hurts? 
Well, you touched on the questions, although I don't think I would ask him about what happened at the end of last year. I mean, I think you'd just be wasting your breath. You know, Devontae was asked that yesterday, and he's like, hey, I'm looking ahead to this year, the past is the past. And I think Jalen would just say the same thing. Um, I would like to know about Kellen Moore and, you know, how – and, again, it's early in this process, right? They've only been together since Monday. I'm sure they've communicated a bunch uh, via text or phone or however uh, – leading up to it after, you know, Kellen Moore was hired, but I'd like to know exactly, uh, you know, what his thoughts on Kellen Moore are and, and this whole, you know, change in sort of philosophy where it's going to be Kellen Moore's offense and um, how well does he know Kellen Moore? I mean, I'd really like to get into Kellen Moore because Kellen Moore has not been made available to talk to us yet. You know, Shocking. Like every single team, I think in the NFL who has made their yeah. coordinators available, uh, the Eagles just don't operate that way. It happened last year. We didn't get to talk to Desai and, um, you know, Brian's last not- year, by the way, Ed, I kind of got it from the perspective of, all right, these are young coaches. It was a long season. You went to the Super Bowl. You could say, all right, all that kind of stuff factors into it. Now you got Vic, who's been coordinating since 1945, and, uh, uh, and Kellen Moore, who's a longtime offense. I mean, come on. These guys can do a press conference in their sleep. Yeah. What, what, are, what is this team afraid of? Competitive advantage, John. I'm sure it's something to do with competitive advantage. But, yeah, I think we'll probably end up getting them on the rookie minicamp weekend. That was when, the, you know, the two guys last year were made available. I think it was like May 11th. Yeah. Um, but, you know, Kellen Moore is a great mystery. I mean, we know what he's done. We've seen his body of work. Like you said, he's been coordinating for quite some time. But, you know, now Jalen is in his offense. And, we'll, you know, how does he feel about it? What's the lines of communication like? And, you know, uh, I, again, I'd like to get a little deeper with Jalen on his leadership style. We got into that kind of at the end of last season when we had Jalen in the darkened locker room after three or four hours of waiting oh, for him oh, to come out and yeah. talk to us. The lights were kind of dimmed inside the locker room. It was 7 o'clock at night. You know, <laughs> we've been there for hours and hours. Uh, but I would like to get, dive in a little bit more about the leadership. Side of things like uh, they didn't pay their generator bill. It was so late. <laughs> I think everybody was ready to go home, and yeah. uh, for some reason, you know, that's when he came out, and, that, and that's fine. Listen, I'm not complaining. We got him, um, which is important. That's the bottom line to talk to the quarterback. And but I'd like to dive into a little bit about the leadership side of things and how he, you know, if he's done anything in the off season, has he had a chance to reflect on how he goes about his business? in the way he, you know, sits on the sidelines. I mean, just kind of by himself. He doesn't look at an iPad, not that we're able to see. Um, you know, has he has he thought about anything along those lines? And is, has he changed in his opinion somewhat uh, in the way he uh, leads the players? Because, you know, there is a big leadership void now with Kelsey and Cox gone. Um, and someone's going to have to step into that void, and it's going to have to be Jalen. And what's that leadership going to look like? And as far as uh, Kellen Moore goes, one thing you haven't seen from Kellen Moore much in his time in the NFL as a play caller is that read option. And you see Jalen Hurts and Saquon Barkley already working out together, which, you know, if it's not on Instagram, then it even happened. And it's on Instagram, (laughs) then working out together. One of the things Saquon Barkley talked about in his introductory press conference with the Eagles was that read option and that linebacker or edge rusher having to make that decision in a fraction of a second. Okay, Jalen Hurts or Saquon Barkley, who am I going to take down? So if you're Kellen Moore, is that something that you're going to see more of? Is that something you're going to introduce into your play calling? Is that something we're going to see a little bit more of with Jalen Hurts? Or is that not just a call by Brian Johnson to not call that play or Nick Sirianni? Or is that something we're going to see again in the upcoming season? Yeah, I think we'll see it. I, you know, I think, you know, even though Kellen Moore hasn't really done that, uh, Nick Sirianni has. And, you know, we were led to believe this is going to kind of be a blend of uh, offensive ideas. So Nick Sirianni's aren't just going to be thrown out the window. Um, they're going to do it. And, you know, Kellen Moore and Nick will work closely and and how that's going to look. Um and we're going to see it. I mean, Saquon said that that's what we're going to see. Now, unless Saquon was completely wrong and was just assuming, hey, you know, this is what they did in the past and this is what we're going to do again. Um, but I think that, you know, they're going to we're going to see it now. How much we're going to see it. Uh, I'd like to see Jalen Hurts under center uh, a little bit more, you know, and and do more play action from under center or even run the ball with Saquon. I'd like to see a little bit more of that traditional under center look. But I think we're still going to see the RPO. Will we see it as much? Maybe not. Um, I think it's going to be a week to week thing and we're going to see, you know, they're going to plan accordingly on whoever they're facing. 
at Kratz E. Make sure you follow Ed on uh, Twitter slash X, SI.com, backslash NFL, backslash Eagles. You can read them there. Um, I don't know if you guys have even seen this yet, but it it, it came out this morning. Um, ESPN uh, sent Don Van Natt and Seth Wickersham, so the, the two big-time investigative reporters ESPN has best in the business along with Jeremy Fowler inside Bill Belichick's failed off season job hunt um, is the piece. And the Eagles reached out to Bill Belichick. Um, and these guys are the two best investigative reporters in the business. A source close to Belichick confirmed there was no talk, however, during the call about working for the Eagles. Roseman, Howie Roseman, called Bill Belichick to check in to see how he was doing. However, there was chatter in league circles that Philadelphia and Belichick could be a match. Um, the Eagles said he still had his fastball. He nearly beat them in the 2023 season openers. We know with an inferior team, they also believe Belichick is going to stick around to beat Don Shula's record. And then they kind of begged off because quote, you'll have to start over again. Uh, who would replace him? You have to have a replacement in mind. Hasn't had a good record of developing coaches. They were afraid He'd have changed everything in the organization. You have to start from scratch. So that was the report. From my perspective, when this kind of stuff comes out, even though it doesn't seem like there was significant interest, but it, that, doesn't it put even more pressure on Nick Sirianni? Like, why are the Eagles even calling Bill? But I get it. Um Friends, Jeffrey Lurie is from Boston. For those who don't know, he wanted to buy the Patriots before he bought the Eagles, has tremendous respect for Bill Belichick, as everyone does. Why? Why do the Eagles do this stuff? Uh, due diligence, right? I mean, how he's in on every player, whenever there's a player available, you know, it's always, well, the Eagles are interested in so-and-so. Uh, how he's reached out to inquire about this player, it doesn't mean they're ready to trade or sign that player, and it's probably the same with the coaches. You know, they're reached out to – a probable Hall of Fame coach, definitely Hall of Fame coach. I yeah, mean, even though he's what I'm going to go definite. Yeah, yeah go. he's a cheater. Man, yeah. Hell with that guy. Yeah, and the whole team was run by Brady, right? I mean, look at Belichick's record. <laughs> oh, wow, Brady we're left. going all right. That's going down. Up. All right. No, listen, hey, Bill Belichick's a first ballot Hall of Famer yeah. for sure. Whenever that day comes, um, but you know, it's just Howie, in my opinion, just reaching out, doing his doing his due diligence. Just reached out to Bill Belichick, say, hey, how you doing? You know, just checking in because is you never any, know. Is there any way that you could frame Nick Sirianni as not being a lame duck this year? He's coaching for his job. Oh, sure. Yeah, of course he is. Um, and you're right. Now you have this big shadow of big bad Bill Belichick, you know, right there in your rearview mirror. Um, that probably put some pressure on him. But Nick's under pressure anyway. I mean, he's got to come out firing, man. This team can't get out to the two and five start. They got to come out. You got to go to Brazil to play the Packers. That's a tough opener, yeah. you know. Just to go to you know twelve hour flight to Brazil, uh, you know, is going to make that a tough opener. And they got the Packers, Jordan Love, Jalen Hurts, great matchup. Um, but yeah, he's under a lot of pressure whether Bill Belichick is out there or not. Um, you know, I did see that article and I glanced at it and I thought that there was a good point that the writer made, I don't know if this was in a quote or not, but they said that when you hire Bill Belichick, you get all of Bill Belichick. And does that mean he's going to leave a big thumbprint on the personnel decisions? I mean, how much impact and how much of an influence is he going to have, uh, you know, on the personnel uh, in that room? If he's not happy with who the Eagles draft this year, for instance, and he comes in next year and says, Hey, we don't like whoever it is. You know, what are the Eagles going to do? I mean, you know, Bill Belichick's not going to just roll over and just be a coach. He says, yeah, I'll just be a coach. But you know he's going to want to get players into the building. You would that's think. what he wants to do. Yeah. So you're going to have to probably tear things down when you hire Bill Belichick to, to build them back up. I mean, I don't know if Bill Belichick will get another job, to be honest. I mean, in this day and age, in, the, in this new NFL, you know, yeah. every year it changes. 
And Belichick's what, 71, 72? Yeah, he's post 70, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I, I don't know. I mean, I, I wouldn't put too much into Howie and him talking because that's just what Howie does. I mean, he does his homework on everybody, coaches, players, front office members. I mean, he he's very active, Howie. He's not just, you know, sitting on the couch watching, you know, television. <laughs> he's he's busy, man. He, uh, he also busy. Yeah, he also tried to get Josh McDaniels at one point. So he has tremendous respect yeah. for that organization. But yeah. uh you're right. They they were yeah, close to I, Josh McDaniels. Yeah. I I look at this um Ed and say, boy, you talk about San Paolo in week one. The Packers are going to be one of those sexy picks because they closed last season so well and yeah. played so well in Dallas. If they go out there and wax the Eagles, say it's 35 to 21. It's going to start really quick for Nick Sirianni, don't you think? Oh, absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, even if they win that game and lose their second, I just think any early season loss is going to be like, oh, here we go. They got to win the following week. It's just each week is going to present its own level of pressure. Um, you know, and even if they're sitting at six and one, I mean, yeah, okay, Nick saved his job, but we'll be like, okay, now what? They were six and one last year, whatever they were. He got ten, to 10 and one, one ten. and then the wheels fell off. So, yeah. is this a sustainable model at six and one? There's still going to be questions. There's going to be Ooh. questions every. Going to be a tough week. season. Going to yeah. be a tough season with these expectations. Yep. Ed, before before we let you go, just real quick on this. Speaking of uh, Nick Sirianni starting out the season on the hot seat, let's say the Eagles do have a great year and everything's great. They go on. They go to a Super Bowl, deep playoff run, whatever. They win a Super Bowl. Has there ever been a team to fire a head coach and replace them immediately? with their offensive coordinator like could happen in Philadelphia because I know it's been an interim tag during the season, but at, yeah. at the end of the season, I, I can't think of a successful team that ever fired their head coach to replace them with their offensive coordinator. <laughs> so if the Eagles win a Super Bowl, they would not fire Nick Sirianni. I, mean, well, I know that, but then Kellen Moore goes elsewhere. Yeah, and then the well, cycle that's repeat. part of it. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's what you get. I mean, that's what you yeah. get. You got a Super Bowl, you know, okay. I know. So, See you later. Yeah, you know, yeah. we'll bring Brian Johnson back because he's going to do great things in Washington, right? Uh, <laughs> no, there's always another guy. I mean, listen, if, they, if that happens, yes. And back to John's point about Belichick possibly being a head coach. Mark, that's a good point. I mean, listen, I think your head coach, your next head coach, if this thing goes sideways, is going to be Kellen Moore. Uh, you know, he was interviewed in 2021 when the Eagles hired Nick Sirianni. So, uh, I, yeah, I don't think Belichick's coming through that door anytime soon Fair for enough. Philadelphia. Ed Kratz, great catch up with you, man. Thanks so much, SI.com, and so much more. Ed, thank you so much, brother. Appreciate yep. you. Yep, good seeing you, Mark. Thank See you, good man. seeing you as well. Good seeing you. Good to catch up with Ed. I haven't seen him in a while, man. All right, we'll be back. Now, we're going to look at that coaching tree. We're going to look at that story as well when we talk about Bill Belichick. Good eye by you, John McMullen. I'm just looking at it right now. It does pose an interesting thing when we talk about Nick Sirianni and his job security. We'll be back here on Birds 365 coming up in a few. Imagine for a moment that you went to work today and when you came home, you were catastrophically injured. Your life and your family's life. That's what happened to union construction worker Mike Little. I was scared of what the end was going to be, but to be 100% honest with you, I knew I was going to be all right just by talking with Brian in my heart. I just knew everything was going to be all right. Call the firm and find out why they say, we got this. Call 215-458-2222. Field of life. First Trust Bank is there for you. Seven is on three. One, two, three. Because Philadelphia dreams deserve a Philadelphia bank. 
Underdog Fantasy is the easiest place to play fantasy sports and certainly the easiest when you're watching the NBA and the NBA playoffs are almost here and you can win money making picks. What are you waiting for? Sign up on underdogfantasy.com and use the promo code WIN. An underdog will double your first deposit up to $100. That's underdogfantasy.com. Use the promo code WIN. Get ready for the NBA and get ready for the NBA playoffs. Go to underdogfantasy.com. Use the promo code WIN. Hi, everybody. My name is Jason Lombardi. I'm an inspector at DryTech. At DryTech, we offer three major services, the first one being basement waterproofing. The second service we offer is foundation and structural repairs. And then the third service that we offer is mold remediation. If you feel you are having a waterproofing issue, give DryTech a call or check us out online. Do you stream on a Roku, Fire Stick, Google TV, or Apple TV? Now you can watch 6ABC 24-7 with the 6ABC Philadelphia streaming app. And the big story on Action News. Search 6ABC Philadelphia and start streaming today. E-A-G-L-E-S. Eagles. Welcome back, Birds 365. Mark Farzetta, John McMullen right there. Ed Kratz just joined us. Chris Franklin will be joining us momentarily. Look forward to catching up with Chris Franklin as well. But, John, you highlighted this story. Um, and, yeah, it does come from ESPN about Bill Belichick and the Eagles. It seemed like a little bit more than just due diligence or kicking the tires here. So my question when it comes to interest in Bill Belichick, would you call it? Uh, when it comes to that, if, do, if things do go awry to start this season, does that start the conversation in the fan base of, could I have Bill Belichick and now you got this guy still? What's going on here? What, how do you take this story? Yeah, I mean, any, if anything goes negative, it'll always be, well, if this, if that, what about this, what about that? And obviously, if you have Bill Belichick and there's a, you know, there's obviously a disconnect with the Eagles fans who, um, you know, we'll bring up as Ed did, uh, the cheating scandal at times, and um, maybe he's not really as good as he is perceived to be because he had Tom Brady all those years and yada, yada, yada. But, um, you know, this is one of the best coaches of all time um, for anybody who's got any objectivity. Um, and, and then you get into the ageism factor post-70, uh, which I always joke is the only ism acceptable in today's overly sensitive world. Uh, so there is something to that. A lot of teams just don't want to bring in an older guy who's obviously far closer to the end than the beginning. Everybody wants Sean McVay. Uh, you know, mid-30s is going to be around if you hit for a long time. And, and that part's legitimate as far as you, you almost need a replacement in mind if you were to hire him. Um, because it's not going to be a long-term thing at this stage. Um, and then the personnel part of it, which is interesting to me because how he's been through this with Chip Kelly um, and, and the one time where he lost uh, sort of that inner organizational battle, it was, I'd like to say, set adrift for a year um, to the other side of the building. Granted, with a raise, Mark, he had the best uh, uh, demotion in history because he got a raise and a better title. But the bottom a line is... A financial apology is always the best yeah. apology. <laughs> but the bottom line is they took away what he what the reason he likes doing the job, the personnel part of it. So it was very difficult for him. Um, and I'm surprised because we go back to Josh McDaniels in 2021. By all indications, it was Howie Roseman who recommended Josh McDaniels to Jeffrey Lurie to be the Eagles' next head coach. And Jeffrey Lurie was the one who wisely said, I don't care what these two tell me right now. They're probably going to butt heads down the road. And I think Jeffrey was right. And that's an indication of, you know, waiting it out and and 
ultimately getting Nick Sirianni certainly worked in the short term. Now, a lot of people don't like Nick now because of the collapse last season, but certainly it would have worked out better than Josh McDaniels. I think we've seen enough of Josh McDaniels now in a number of instances as a head coach. Plus, when he left Indianapolis at the altar, the guy's a freaking disaster. He might be a good offensive coordinator, but he's a disaster as a head coach. And then with Bill, you know, when he was talking to Atlanta, he seemed amenable to realizing he's going to have to work with others. It's not going to be like it was in New England, where he basically had his own fiefdom and everybody had to follow him. So could he coexist with Howie? I guess they're friends. Um, if I were a betting man, I, I wouldn't count on that, Mark. So well, I, I, yeah, I, I got some friends that I know I can't work with. I'll, I'll put it to you like that. And what the story highlights, I think anyone, you don't have to be, I don't think a beat reporter for the Eagles media for the Eagles or anything like that. I think any Eagles fan that really follows this team understands that the number one thing on a resume, the number one objective with the Eagles is you have to let how you have to let Jeffrey Lurie feel like he owns the team. That was the great sin that Chip Kelly committed. He didn't make Jeffrey Lurie feel like he was still the owner of the team that he owned. And Bill Belichick's going to come in here, and as the story does point out, you're getting all of Bill Belichick. Bill Belichick's not taking some um, Bill Parcells front office job, and that's it. He's going to be front office. He's going to coach. He's going to go with the Parcells line of, if you want me to cook dinner, I got to buy the groceries. So he's going to be heavily involved in how the organization is run and, quite frankly, running the organization with Jeffrey Lurie approving money being spent. And that's the way it's going to go down. And Howie Roseman would go back to the cap guy, and that's not happening. You're just a dummy if you're not uh, um, making the owner feel like he owns the team. So that part, I think I think Bill's a better politician than Chip Kelly. Mm -hmm. I think he would handle that, Bill. He's got a great relationship with Jeffrey Lurie already. Uh, because as I mentioned, um, Jeffrey uh, grew up in Boston and, and has tremendous respect and tried to copy that organization, basically. Um, you know, the old gold standard quote. Right. Um, tried to become the Patriots in a lot of ways. Um, so he has tremendous respect. I, I don't think that part of it would be a problem. Um, but the part of it with Howie and Bill, yeah, that, you know, it's easy to say you can coexist. And then when it comes down to that first time where you have to butt heads um, and Bill Belichick wants to put his foot down and say, look at the rings and I'm the one going to the hall of fame. Although, you know, now they're letting GMs in the hall of fame. So who knows? Um, yeah. I mean, I, I, I don't think it would work. Uh, and certainly the short term aspect of it is not how the Eagles do business. If you think about the Eagles coach, think about it since really, you know, it was Ray Rhodes. It was Andy Reid. Nobody knew who the hell Andy Reid was at, at the time in 1999. I mean, how often do you see somebody jump from position coach to head coach in the NFL? Mm -hmm. um, and now Andy Reid's Andy Reid. So people forget about that. Um, probably the only high profile name they ever hired was chip chip was if you remember mark the hot candidate at that time you know it was pretty clear because he had gotten in trouble at oregon he was looking to get out and go to the nfl and even then he debated back and forth and when things were looking a little rosier he said oh, i'm gonna stay in college um the Eagles started to go in a different direction that was the gus bus gus bradley year i believe um, and then Chip changed his mind and they said, all right, we're going to bring in Chip and Chip did a lot of good things. I, I, you know, he's a Jeff Stoutland. Yeah. Jeff Stoutland. I, I think a lot of the sort of off the field stuff he brought to the NFL, he was ahead of the curve. A lot of that stuff still exists, you know, whether it comes to, conditioning and sports science and all that kind of stuff. He was ahead of the curve. He was ahead of the curve with tempo. Ironically, Bill Belichick loved Chip Kelly. And 
always wanted to pick Chip's brain about tempo and how he used tempo. The, the difference between Bill, Bill was smart enough to know, all right, you have to have a filter with that. Chip was like, go, 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 a million miles an hour. Mm -hmm. And uh, Bill kind of knew, well, you know, you can't have Jason Peters running around like a 19-year-old kid. You have to have a filter. When you have a big lead, you have to be able to take your foot off the gas pedal and manage the clock and things like that. But he had tremendous respect for Chip Kelly. Um, and then post-Chip Kelly, we all know what happened. Uh, Doug Peterson, you know, they wanted Adam Gase. They wanted Ben McAdoo. Sometimes it's better to be lucky than good. Um, and then with Nick Sirianni, he was about to, you know, down the list. And the only interview <clears throat> Nick Sirianni got was with the Philadelphia Eagles. So he was off the radar. Mm -hmm. So the Eagles tend to go off the radar with little known coaches more than the big splash. But yeah. Belichick's a little bit different because of Jeffrey's respect for him and the Patriots organization. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the other two guys you mentioned have that emotional <laughs> intelligence that we, we we've grown to know, yes. know yes. so much in, in Philadelphia. Yes. Uh, getting off the Belichick topic, something else I wanted to get into with you because it wasn't just Nick and how he addressed the media yesterday. Devonte Smith was also talking about his new contract extension. Uh, and it, it brought me back to kind of the day the Eagles signed Saquon Barkley. And when the Eagles signed Saquon <laughs> Barkley, uh, the fan version that's still very much alive inside of me, um, kind of turned the page on, okay, last season was a horrible ending. It was never really pretty. Probably the prettiest it ever got was manhandling Vic Fangio, of all people, in that win against the Miami Dolphins. That made you look like, oh, maybe this team is the real deal. Maybe they will control teams from this point on. Maybe they will control their own destiny from this point on and really have a chance to be that not only number one seed, but a Super Bowl contender. Because to that point, they really never looked like a Super Bowl contender. And they go on to only have two wins in the season that were more than 10 points. And to compare that to a year ago, they had six or two years ago now, they had six wins of a 10-point differential or more. So they were in control of those games. So they signed Saquon Barkley to start to turn the page to look forward to the upcoming season. Listening to Devontae Smith talk about how potent this offense can be. And I know we got questions and we just talked about with Ed Kratz. I'm sure we'll talk about it with Chris Franklin coming up in a second, John. But I. I am very much looking forward to Kellen Moore's influence on this offense in general, and then also see the embarrassment of riches you have at the skilled positions of this offense. So assuming that the Eagles offense will, in the worst case, the Eagles offensive line, in the worst case, be solid. Not Swiss cheese, of course, with holes, but solid Cam Jurgens at guard, whoever they bring in for depth. Tyler Steen at right guard or Matt Hennessy at right guard, Lane Johnson playing at a level he can play at. When you think about the, the sky and where the limit really is for this Eagles offense, where is it in your mind? Can they be the number one offense in the NFL? Uh, yeah, why not? Um, certainly they should be in the conversation. I always say if you're in, if you're, you know, RG3 said they had the best roster in football. The other day, we were talking about that yesterday with Mike Gill, but, um, and I said, you know, that's a quarterback looking at the skill position players. The Eagles still have a lot of holes on defense, but yeah, they're, they're top five. So anytime you're top five, you, you might have that. If everything clicks, you might have that special season. You might be number one overall. Um, they were number eight last year. <laughs> I mean, to me, it's astonishing that people think they had a bad offense last year. They were number eight in the NFL. They were, I forget, they were number one in third down defense and number two on four, or vice versa. Mm -hmm. So in situational football, they were unbelievable. They were actually better than they were in 2022. Um, they were really good offensively. AJ had his usual 14, 1500 yards. Devontae's over a thousand yards. DeAndre Swift over a thousand yards. They had a pro bowl running back, by the way, for the second consecutive season. The year before, Miles Sanders had 1,269 yards and averaged 4.9 yards per carry. They're good 
offensively. How much better are they going to get? They better get better. <laughs> I mean, again, the expectations and people roll their eyes, not that they're necessarily a bad thing, but unrealistic expectations can be a bad thing. And last year, going into last year, Mark, they were unrealistic, especially with new coordinators. Um, the fact that there wouldn't be growing pains. Um, and in the case of the offense specifically, because they lack talent on defense. But remember, the year prior, they had the number two defense in the NFL and were 12 yards away from having the number one defense. They had the number one passing defense. So they dropped off a cliff defensively. Mm -hmm. um, offensively, they didn't drop off a cliff. They went from number three to number eight. Um, Miles was a little less effective, uh, but most of it, let's be honest, if Jalen Hurts plays like he did in 2022, they're the same offense. Mm. Same offense. So if your expectations are Saquon Barkley, who's done it once in his career as a rookie, has better numbers than, say, Miles Sanders, significant better numbers running the football, um, what is AJ going to get? 1,700 yards? What is Devontae going to get? 1,200 yards? What are your expectations? Um, My expectation, I'll, I'll answer that question. This better be a top three offense. If, if With these weapons, anything outside the top three, and look, wins are what matter overall, but we saw last year they were 10 and 1, but they never really looked like legit 10 and 1 throughout that, with the exception of the Miami game that I highlighted earlier. But for me, my expectation is better with these weapons and an offensive mind like Kellen Moore, not Brian Johnson. At the worst, it better be a top three offense. Well, that's tough, man. I mean, I, I, well, I'll, I'll, I'll look at it from the perspective of you literally almost can't be better in situational football. Mm -hmm. If you're well, number one, you can't be better than number one. If you're number two, you can go be number one. Um, so – are they going to be better on third downs? I, I I would say, you know, if you're a statistician, you'll say there's going to be some regression to the mean. Probably you're not going to be that good back-to-back -back years in situational football. So all of a sudden, if drives aren't extended, um, a lot of this depends on Saquon. Let's be honest. AJ's already here, was already mm -hmm. here. Devontae's already here. Um, Dallas Goddard was already here, the offensive line. And by the way, you're losing Jason Kelsey. Um, so that factors into it as well. It, and to me, it has to do with not only Saquon Barkley, but Saquon Barkley in the passing game. Because, again, 1,269 yards and 4.9 yards per carry. Saquon's had one better season than that in his entire career. And that was his rookie season before the ACL, before the 1500 touches. Now he doesn't have the, it's fair to point out the context. He doesn't, he's got a better supporting cast, but you know, if he's rushing for 1500 yards and all of a sudden AJ's getting, and we got to get the Chris Franklin, AJ's Ooh. getting 1200 yards. Are people happy with that? If Devonte Smith is getting 900 yards, this is, this is, a good problem to have is the old cliche. Mark, oh, right here there. we go. The good problem to have. Good John problem McClellan. to have. And what word is in good problem? Problem. Problem. <laughs> John, I'm telling you right now, if they don't have a top three offense, blow it up. Blow it up. Bring in Belichick. No. All right. Anyway, we're going to we're gonna get Chris. We're going to get. There's no with having high standards. but I, I concur. Hi, uh, Chris Franklin saying hi to us in our chat. All right, so we'll hit the break. We'll talk to Chris Franklin coming up, get his thoughts on what's going on with the Eagles, what Jalen Hurts could say today, what he wants to ask Jalen Hurts, and also uh, what his expectations are for this Eagles team as well as the draft. Coming up, Chris Franklin joins us on Birds 365.
Imagine for a moment that you went to work today, and when you came home, you were catastrophically injured. Your life and your family's life. That's what happened to union construction worker Mike Little. I was scared of what the end was going to be, but to be 100% honest with you, I knew I was going to be all right just by talking with Brian. In my heart, I just knew everything was going to be all right. Call the firm and find out why they say, we got this. Call 215-458-2222. Field of life. First Trust Bank is there for you. Champions on three. One, two, three. Because Philadelphia dreams deserve a Philadelphia bank. Underdog Fantasy is the easiest place to play fantasy sports and certainly the easiest when you're watching the NBA. And the NBA playoffs are almost here and you can win money making picks. What are you waiting for? Sign up on underdogfantasy.com and use the promo code WIN. An underdog will double your first deposit up to $100. That's underdogfantasy.com. Use the promo code WIN. Get ready for the NBA and get ready for the NBA playoffs. Go to underdogfantasy.com. Use the promo code WIN. Hi everybody, my name is Jason Lombardi. I'm an inspector at DryTech. At DryTech we offer three major services. The first one being basement waterproofing. The second service we offer is foundation and structural repairs. And then the third service that we offer is mold remediation. If you feel you are having a waterproofing issue, give DryTech a call or check us out online. Do you stream on a Roku, Fire Stick, Google TV, or Apple TV? Now you can watch 6ABC 24-7 with the 6ABC Philadelphia streaming app. And the big story on Action News. Search 6ABC Philadelphia and start streaming today. E-A-G-L-E-S. Eagles. Welcome back, Birds 365, Mark Farzetta, John McMullen with you and joining us. And I, I've never, Chris, this is the first, I've never had someone say hi to us in our private chat before we brought them on. So now officially, Chris, hello. How are you? Hey, Mark, how you doing? Hey, John, how you guys doing? It's, it's fun to be on here. I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying the day already. How you guys doing today? Uh, doing well. Uh, it, it got a little bit more exciting. The quarterback is going to talk uh, later this morning chris uh what do you want to ask jalen first you want to you want to talk about kellen moore and doug nussmeyer or you want to talk about <laughs> his buddy Devonte smith getting 25 million do you want to talk about his off-season work where where's chris franklin want to go first how do you divvy up those targets and decide to throw keep everybody happy oh, in this offense yeah. now? Because that's a really tough thing it's when you're looking at it. We were just talking about it, Chris. Oh, gosh. Like, uh, it's tough because you, you got to keep – not only do you got to keep the outside guy, you got to keep Dallas Goddard happy. You got to make sure Quan gets his touches. Which, like, how do you – like, to be to be a quarterback, I know you got to do the best – the team offense in the best position possible and all that stuff. But how do you keep everybody happy? That's where – I'm, uh, I'm going to use a Syrianism, which I got to stop doing. But yeah, the whole like, you got to keep it's about the connections and everything. But now you got to make sure you do all that stuff. Buddy. I'm talking about connections. Football IQ. <laughs> <laughs> got to be accountability. Yeah. yeah accountability. <laughs> you know, I, Chris, I got I got an answer for that. And I'm not going to put words in your mouth, John's mouth, or uh, uh, Jalen Hurts. But how do you keep everybody happy? I'll tell you. Uh, win. Win. Yeah. And put up a lot of points. No, no, not just win because. Even if you win, I know it's a great deodorant for everybody Mark, else. But... Got, yeah, Mark, Mark's got you got to win and have a top three offense. That's, yeah, win yeah, and, and have a top three offense because that's how you'll keep everybody happy. And here's the one thing. Here's why I'm not concerned about the touches. I'm more concerned about the wins. The, the Eagles have gotten touches. They've had running backs, even of not not of Saquon Barkley's ilk, get his touches. They've had wide receivers already here, and the same wide receivers that'll be here, at least the two main targets, they've gotten their touches. When Dallas Goddard is healthy, he has gotten his touches. For me, sharing the football won't be the problem. It's that if somebody is getting 
Not a little bit, because I think they're a good enough core where a little bit won't bother. But if somebody is getting a lot more of the glory, that's where a problem would happen. But the touches, I think, will come. But when you come uh, and, and talk about the Eagles' actual overall production, if everyone has a big piece of that huge pie, that's how I think you keep everybody happy. I think that's a big thing. And you mentioned top three. I think they're going to need that, especially the defense. There's still need some questions on that, too. So you really have to make sure that they're putting up that 27, 30 a game because we, we, we've seen this scheme beforehand. Even though you got the guy who designed it, there's could be holes in, when it comes to passing off the coverage responsibility, stuff like that. So you really do need this unit to act like you're paying them to be like a top three unit. You need them to start producing in that way as well, too. Yeah, we never talk about the defense, Chris, because the offense has so much skill, position, talent, and RG3's out there saying the Eagles have the best roster in the NFL because clearly he's not looking at the defensive side. It it seems to me um, they have basically come into the season or come into the offseason with a plan of – we're going to have this great offense, and Vic will figure it out on defense. Are they putting too much pressure on Vic Fangio? Yeah, especially since you took away one of his best players, Son Reddick. He, he, since he's gone now, you really put a lot of strain on that, and you're hoping you get a guy who hasn't done it to the amount of snaps that Reddick did in, in Bryce Huff to basically say, hey, welcome to the team. you got to be Son Reddick now, and it's still true. I know he had a good year last year with 10 sacks, but you don't know that. Linebacker core, you have to make sure that Nicobe stays healthy the whole entire time. You got Devin White. I think he's going to play better in the system, but you still be unsure because he lost his job out in Tampa Bay of all places. So I look at the, those factors, and I still have a lot of question marks. And I don't know how you get this pressure because I still see teams just going one, two, three, dink and dunk, and then death by a thousand paper cuts. And I still have my worries about that. Yeah, we have seen, as I like to describe it, Chris, we've seen the Vic Fangio cover band. For the last three years, now we're seeing the you know the original act. Okay, we're we're yeah. seeing the actual Rolling Stones here. Uh, when when sometimes, it comes to his... uh, sometimes the cover mark is better than the original. <laughs> yeah, not sometimes the <laughs> not with the Stones, but uh, you had a better cover band for two years than last year's cover band, which is like a Jersey Shore cover band. <laughs> exactly. Oh, <geez>. Exactly. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Now I need to see John McMullen at the OD just having having himself a good time. Anyway, uh, <laughs> Secret Service play. Uh, when it comes to your expectations, though, overall, the grand scheme of things here with Vic Fangio and this defense, what are you expecting? Are you expecting strictly quarters and no blitzing and all that? But what are your overall expectations for Vic Fangio and what he's going to do as the original band of this scheme? I think it's going to be one of the things I think you'll see more, maybe more pressures. But even then, I still think that that secondary, I, I have faith in the corners, but I just think teams can want to continually to make, miss that middle of that field. I think they're going to continually attack that field. And I wouldn't be surprised if the defense finishes somewhere in the 15, between like 12 and 15 range. And for them, they'll take that. But when you have the guys that you have, especially on that back seven, this team should be in top 10 no matter what. And you saw what happened that Super Bowl year. You have both units, both offense and defense in that top 10. And you need to be that because we, Imagine this. Imagine right now, right? This defense going against the Lions. Do you feel comfortable with that? You imagine this defense right now going Ooh. against the 49ers. You feel comfortable oh, with that too? Man, you just so woke it's... me up, Chris. Yeah, saying. stop <laughs> taking the fun out of this. Yeah. Yeah. Chris. It's ugly, man. I, I, I just pictured an ugly scenario. Thank you. Uh, so that's why you need that offense to outscore everybody. I just think right now, especially with the Lions getting better, I think you get better with maybe IU. That whole situation makes the 49ers take some step back. But I just look at the Lions right now and just go like, you know what? They have a lot of pieces, and can they match up well? So it's going to be, that game, if it ever comes down to it, I think it's going to have to be a shootout. You're going to need hey, man, to what about week one in Brazil? You got Jordan Love, and now Josh Jacobs is there. I don't get why they moved on from Aaron Jones, but whatever. They still got a good run. They got about 75 good receivers, young, and they're all young. Uh, it could start early and quickly and ugly for the Eagles if they don't figure out some things on the defensive side. But – how he got a little bit surly, Mark and I talked about early in the show when he got asked about Hassan Reddick. I thought it was unfair. I thought it was a le- legitimate question. But I, I also understand his frustration because as a GM, I think a lot of people want to grade each of their moves individually. And it's a whole mosaic you try to put together. And I think how he got a little bit frustrated with 
those saying Hassan Reddick is about only Hassan Reddick. It's about Bryce Huff. It's about Nolan Smith. It's about age. It's about money. Yada, 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 go on and on and on. Um, were you a little surprised that he got uh, thrown off a little bit? Because he's had a lot of experience. He should be able to handle that a little bit better. I thought it was a little terse when he came to the uh, talking about that pick. Uh, I think it was a Dave's first question. Yeah. When he talked about that pick, I was like, okay, yeah, yeah in a vacuum. But it, it really is because you, you do have to look at it because say if you kept him this year, I know you may not – probably couldn't make one move or what have you, but say if you kept him this year, you still have a good rotation of guys edge out there. And then if he left, somebody was going to sign him to a big deal. So you probably get a comp pick, maybe even to the point where you're looking, maybe you get a top, it's, it's one of the third, third round compensation picks. So basically to me, the way I look at it, it's like you basically traded for like 16, 17 slots higher than what you got for a potential comp pick just to get them back. And it's like, is that worth losing 27 sacks over two seasons? And to me, it's not. Uh, you really do need that guy. And hey, I'm hope I'm wrong that Bryce Huff and Bryce Huff all of a sudden plays that. I hope he plays a run better than what he's had beforehand. And he goes right. I hope I have. I don't have as much. I have many questions about Josh Sweat, but I hope Nolan Smith develops into that guy they think they that they got they got and they took the first round because just based off what we saw this year, I know guys get better, but based on what I saw last year, I am I have questions. I'm, I'm reserving some things right right now until I see. Well, you should. Nobody should be counting on Nolan Smith. The hope is that, you know, maybe gains a little bit weight and he's got a year in an NFL um, weight room. Maybe he's better equipped. You got maybe his shoulder works procedure done on his shoulder. Hopefully that's fixed. Uh, And, and maybe it takes off, but um, yeah, I thought uh, I I got both sides of that. I thought Dave asked a a legitimate question that should have been answered more thoughtfully. Yet. I also get how he's frustration because it's my own. I try to explain on this show every day. It's about more than one move. It's everything. And he used the term vacuum, which I always use. It's not in a vacuum. (laughs) He's right. He's right. Yeah. And anyway. when, when Howie did say, when Howie said, I mean, we could talk about the complexities of this team and what goes into it. I'm like, isn't that why we're here? Isn't this why the press conference is yeah, happening? Well, that's part. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, your job like, to explain it. Like if you want to call a reporter on, on bull and look, I, the first thing I remember my, my professor at Temple university was a guy named Bill or Dean. And I, mer- I, 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 he was at the Inquirer for years and all that, but Bill, you know, it's it's never about you. You you don't have dialogue during a press conference. You simply ask questions, and that's something I always try to keep in mind. But if somebody was trying to make an issue of it, which Howie would, because Howie, th- there's an easy out for Howie. The it's question is, that, oh, yeah, it is. Yeah, You're that, that dummy. The, uh, uh. <laughs> the question is essentially, and I get why. How this is where I understand Howie's point. It's like you're asking me what the benefit is of trading a player. The benefit is the pick. We got the pick in return. So we feel like we can use that asset to make this team better. Well, End of it. And even that, I'll go, you know, and we got younger and we got more cost effective. You can uh, you can go a bunch of different ways. Sure. sure. I, I thought sure. he was unfair to Dave, but I, agree. I got his frustration was, mm-hmm. was my point. Um, he also gave an interesting question, Chris, which we haven't brought up. So I'll bring it up with you. He got asked about Jeremiah Trotter Jr., um, who, you know, because of his dad, there's a lot of Eagles fans who focused in on him very early. Um, I don't know if he's worthy. I don't, I don't even know if he's a day two pick, to be honest, from a personal perspective. If he falls to 120, I'd say, yeah, maybe that's a nice little dart throw. Um, but how he gave a pretty involved answer on that one about players who may have a better understanding about what it takes to play in Philadelphia. Do you think he was just paying lip service to Jeremiah's dad and what he's meant to the Eagles? Or you think it, 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 he really takes that into account when it comes to players that might have some better understanding of what it's like to play in Philadelphia? I think you really do have to take it because we all know when it comes to those draft reports they have, we say, okay, well, we know the physical attributes are there, but there's that, there's that mental side as well too. When it comes to that pressure, there come, you, you want to see how they do in those pressure situations, and you have to really do it in the city as well too. Because I know we're all going to, we're all going to be looking focused focus on it. We're all going to be in that locker, room, and some guys have have trouble handling that. So I think that was the key there. When I look at him, when I look at Trotter, I, I look at Trotter Jr. 
I have him. I think he still goes like in the third round. But I think by then the Eagles might either have Edwin Cooper or Peyton Wilson Wills by then. I I look the way that they play. I I really think they're getting a linebacker in that second round. I the only thing I would I would love Cooper. The only thing is I think he's rise a little bit and he might go be before fifty. Yeah, I does, think they're in no man's they, land with Cooper. They can't yeah. take him to twenty two, but I don't think he's getting to fifty. Yeah, yeah. So I I probably look. I think Wilson would probably be the guy that you look at. I think either what if you get either one of those two is fine with Trotter. I like the way when he blitzes, but the thing is, you got a defensive coordinator who doesn't like to blitz that much. Yeah. And I look at him in space a little bit more, and I have my questions about that. He got better as the season went on when he was a Clemson, but I have my questions if you get him one on one on the outside in, in, in space in that flat area or the hook to curl area. I got my questions on that. So he's, I think he's going to be a decent prospect. Do I think he'd be a good fit for the Eagles right now? Uh, I have questions. Where, where, can I just ask real quick? Chris, where is this mythical linebacker who can match up with the Christian McCaffrey's of the world or slot receivers and take them down the field? Because I, I, I constantly hear that. They don't exist. All right, that's the whole point on offense. You're trying to get matchups on these guys, isn't it? Like, yeah, what it are is. we looking yeah. for here? McCaffrey's I, I, a unicorn. I, I, yeah, well, McCaffrey's he's a unicorn. unicorn. <laughs> he's all yeah. like, all right, yeah, good looking at like, I, <laughs> yeah, I, good looking I, at him. Yeah. I hear to this day, Chris, TJ Edwards couldn't cover anybody. And and you look at PFF and he was top 10 coverage linebacker in the NFL. I mean, what, what are people looking at that they think there's all these great coverage linebackers? Like Devin White, because he can run. And as you mentioned with the blitzing aspect, okay, what is that? How does that help me? Big's not blitzing. So what does that mean for, <laughs> for Devin White? Um, if you're not in the right position, I guess my I guess my question is man to man, what linebacker covers people? Yeah, so a few of them, especially if you get the guy coming out the flat, like is responsible when it comes to that depending on the coverage, eh? But when you look at the guy coming out the flat. You go, you key on him. You got the guy who's coming out in the hook area. You got key on him. Man to man guys, it's not that many that are out there that can do it. No. I think there's one in the draft. I think Cooper can do it. Just not just for his physical attributes. I think when you look at the way he can get on the inside outside, that's why I really like him, especially because I think this team doesn't have that type of guy on there right now. Besides, and even White had his issues, even though he had like 60, I think he gave up a 65.4 whatever quarterback rate, something 65, 71 in one of those ranges there. So, there are guys out there. I know teams put the safeties in there in a big nickel and they and they try to cover up that way. But when you have an opportunity like to get a Cooper who can do all that, you need to just fix it because they don't come around easily. I mean, Wilson, I put maybe toward that edge to be able to do that as well too. So when you have players, about, it, it, it does come down to, down to athleticism. I think that's that's a key thing on there. But you when you have an instinct and a that knack in that field to say, hey, you know what, I can match up with that running back, which teams do a lot. I think you have that available. So that's why I think they really do need to use that fifth number 50 or even package 50 and one of those fifth round picks to move up a couple slots to make sure to get to one of those guys. Yeah. The only thing that jumped to my mind was <clears throat> if, if they decide if they, if there's a offensive lineman that they really like for whatever reason, they can't get them. That's the only Avenue. I see the Eagles maybe trading out of the second round, trading back or even trading back in the second round further to maybe get another second round pick and maybe take a guy like Edron Cooper in that regard. If that happens, I think that'll be an awesome case for for the Eagles and Eagles fans. I think they would love to see that. Um, but when to, to flip it back to the offense for a second here and, and Jalen Hurts, looking at the receivers you have, the receivers you have locked up, bringing in, obviously, Saquon Barkley, is there more or, or less pressure on Jalen Hurts to perform this year? When you look at the year he could have with this offense, should I, I think from a standpoint, it, it should, should be easier with these weapons. But also, there's no excuses now for Jalen Hurts. I know you had one year of Brian Johnson where he had no year, no experience of calling plays in the offense. So when you look at Jalen Hurts, more or less pressure for him going into this season. I think it's more because I think every, the whole everybody's just looking at the offense right now and just look at that too. There's more pressure, and they're going to have to perform. And I look at the his makeup and what we've seen so far, and I think he can actually handle that. I think it's one of those things where we see a year where we see – a Jalen Hurts that's back in the MVP conversation week 15, 16, 17, almost to the point we saw him back in 2022. I think you, he's in line to do that. And I think you're going to need, I think you're going to see the Jalen Hurts when it comes to being a vocal leader more and more. I know we, 
we've seen him in those locker room things. He talks, he's the guy's guy to talk before he break him down, stuff like that and, and everything. But I think when it comes to him interacting more, I think we'll see that version of him as well too. So it'll be a leap from what we saw last uh, last year. I think it's going to be one of those things where I have a lot, I actually have a lot of confidence, even though he's going to have a lot more pressure. I think he'll come through this year. I really yeah. think when you look at everything that happens. I think if you ask anybody this question, it's going to be a combination of everything. But of the three things that it could be a combination of, the the leap that you mentioned, is it more so because Jalen Hurts figured it out? Is it more so because Kellen Moore is a great offensive coordinator? Is it more so that Howie Roseman is surrounded with a plethora of talent? I think when it comes to uh, – I think it's more of a system. I think it's one of the things where it's going to be – when you look at it, there's going to be outs. I mean, how many times do we see – they they ran go routes all the time. There was no outlet for him to throw it, and he's just holding it down and scramble around, and then ball throw either throw away or he's running around like for six seven yards, and you're like, what, what was this? Or or the wide receiver screen that like first and two, like we know it's gonna be wide receiver screen or Almost inside screen. run. Oh, which one was gonna be? Like, yeah, right, one right. Like, so I look yeah. at that and I'm thinking, like, I think the scheme's gonna help him out even more. I think the, even if they even, more, even, yeah, yeah, yeah. Even yeah. If they didn't have a. Some of these other, even if they have Saquon, I thought this was going to help out this offense a lot more as well. So when they had Saquon, that was just a cherry on top. He's going, you know what? All right, this could be. By the way, if they still, and and let's be honest, they're still going to use the bubble screen because it's a staple in the modern NFL. Everybody right. uses it. It's not just the Eagles. Um, let's have Saquon run that and not the receivers. I said that last year with DeAndre yeah. Swift. You probably remember. I'm like, why? The whole point of the bubble screen is you got to make the first guy miss, right? Mm-hmm. You, you got to get a good block and you got to make that first guy miss. And then maybe you make something of it. Running backs are more equipped to do that than receivers. Um, why not? I They should have used Swift that way. Why not use Saquon that way? That's an easy way to get them involved. And even and even with this, especially with all this the tight quarters out there, you got one little one little hole cut and go. Oh, I wonder what position is used to that. Oh yeah, yeah. We're worried about it. yeah. <laughs> and it comes to that, but it was to me it was just the predictability about the thing. Yeah. Because if you have, we, I, I wish I you know, maybe I should do a story on this because I look at you look at first downs the way it did every like every series you see like first and ten, especially in the fourth quarter, you try to slow them down. Either it was like a it was like a it was like a check. It's like okay, either we're gonna throw it outside to Devontae, throw it outside to AJ. Or throw outside or Quez when that one run a screen or you know what let me turn around hand the ball off to the other try to do something up the middle and like okay it was it seemed like it was one of those two things it got to the point where defense defense are just like all right we're gonna just walk up to the line we're gonna we're gonna play you up yeah. five maybe five yards from well, the line it's a and stupid go stupid numbers game it's all right there's the extra guy let's throw it outside extension of the running game yada 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 it's the ugliest play in football I say that all the time the most non-aesthetic play in football, but um thanks you because, yeah, <laughs> thanks, yeah tips brought a lot of things that's one of them um number 22 overall did you get any further indications of where the eagles might be leaning or did howie do his job and completely um obfuscate everything I've been trying for a long, and I was lo- really trying to glean every single little thing he was trying. To. I still don't know his team. <laughs> like every time he's like, you know what? I, I think I have this. Yeah. And then by design, I think that's where they want to be. But even then, still, I, I still have this weird feeling of trading back because to not to have. I know they're going to treat that fifty three like a, another third round pick, like a really high third round pick, because even second. But I just the fact that he won't be able to select anybody from then always oh, something. Sums up. I think you trade, I trade back. back you I've, I've said, Chris, I want Graham Barton, but I can't pick him at twenty-two. But, but yeah. And by the way, I wouldn't be surprised if somebody else takes him earlier, and he's not even there at twenty-two. But from the Eagles' perspective, um, they're never going to take an interior offensive lineman that high. And, and yeah, people can go back to Danny Watkins, but come on, that's a different era already. Life <laughs> moves fast. They, they don't do it now. But that, to me, it, one of the safest picks in the draft, day one starter, right guard, bang, go. You can play Sunday if you want. I love that pick, but you got to trade down to do it. See, I think one of those tackles are still going to be there. And I'm looking at the Cardinals, the fact uh, – uh, I keep messing his name up, I apologize. UCLA's Latai Latu. I think that's what I wanted to Well, to me, I he's medical. Yeah. I mean, tell me what – 
Arshtanota says, and I'll give you my opinion on Latu. He'd like to say, <laughs> guess what? You can't take this kid. And the Eagles are like, oh. and then they'll get yelled at, like DK Metcalf. They get yelled at, oh, you look pissed on DK. They, they red flagged him. I mean, the medical staff said could take him till the day three. So I think I really is. think the Cardinals are interested. I think the Cardinals are interested. And that's a team where you go, hey, remember how you tamper with us? Yeah, uh, you owe us one. <laughs> Give us a third round. And go I think the Eagles might. Hey, hey tamper is <laughs> coming. There's a lot of talk that Atlanta will have to flip spots with Minnesota because Kirk Cousins admitted tampering in his opening press conference in Atlanta. <laughs> and the Eagles could get hit with tampering this year because of Chicago what Chicago could get hit then, too. I think yeah. Chicago, the fact you have all those little details all sorted out where the contract with DeAndre Swift just so happens, you know, I want this one in this specific wow. number in this year that, and this year not, and this year. That's not tampering. Mm. That's acceptable. <laughs> that's acceptable tampering. Um, what the Eagles did, and and by the way, and I don't know if this is the case, but somebody down at the Novacare complex told me there were a bunch of teams complaining about uh Vic in the Eagles because that was clearly tampering. Yeah, that was tampering. Um, in the <laughs> NFL, it more about the actual tampering. It's if you're you're too overt about it, they're going to make an example out of you. So just keep that in the back of your mind. There might be some tampering news coming down, guys. Oh, you mean obvious? Like you know, you're having an end of the season press conference, and it breaks that Vic Fangio is coming to Philadelphia. I mean, <laughs> obvious like that. Pretty, pretty overt, as I said. <laughs> that wasn't pretty exactly overt. how he rose, but in Jeffrey Lurie's smoothest moment. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I think clearly there, and I think you look at a lot of the situations. I mean, Saquon Barkley after legal tampering, and then boom, all of a sudden he's allowed. James Franklin. James, Outs that yeah, whole situation, yeah. of course, thanks, or thanks, Miss James Reds Franklin. Yeah, right. Yeah, you know, you know, obviously, Chris's cousin. Obviously, um, didn't go to Temple, Mark. I, <laughs> I forgot to mention Temple when you brought up Matt Hennessy. Hell yeah, um, baby. Hell yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. But yeah, so you look at all that. But uh, when when it, when it comes to the offensive line, we're used to having a lot of depth at that position, Chris. And if they don't trade back, are you leaning in the direction of this team to get back to John's question in terms of leaning one way or another? Is conventional wisdom going to play out here where they don't trade back and they do take that offensive lineman in the first round? Do you think that's the most likely scenario to play out? We're going to have to – I think we're going to be writing the story and eating our vegetables about, hey, it's an offensive line when you need this one. All right. You've seen this beforehand. It seems to happen. Yeah. I, 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 I love that. Eating your vegetables. That's a great way to put it. And no <laughs> dip. It, when it's an <laughs> offensive lineman for depth, it's, there's no dip with those vegetables. How yeah. come those teams up in 10 and 11 getting ice cream and they're getting Brock Powers? No, you have to eat, you know, get your spinach and Tyler yeah. Guyton or Mary Smith. You're right. Anyway. And then three <laughs> years when they turned into Landa Dickerson, everybody's happy. Yeah. Oh, it's perfect. Everything's great. No, you got to do it. Yeah, so it's, it, I think we're, we're added to that. I wouldn't be surprised if I did like a guy like Zinter or something like that later on in the draft, too. I think he's, oh, I like I think he's another guy that's really good, a guy who's really fit them as well, too. Maybe be that guard guy that can really compete with like Steen and coming into the next year. So I can see... I'm taking a couple yeah, guys. They really need to rebuild offensive it. Offensive line draft. So I'll leave it there. That'll uh, at C Franklin News. Make sure you follow Chris. Obviously, uh, friend of the show does a tremendous job. NJ.com. Thank you. Um, you, you're right in the fact that you can get really, really competent uh, offensive linemen a little bit later, and maybe they can compete. And you throw them out there. You bring up Zach Zinner and say, "Hey." Go compete with Tyler Steen, and maybe you have something. Iron sharpens iron. Throw all the cliches out there you want, and maybe you fix it that way, and you're able to go corner early in the draft. Here's my concern about corner, Chris. This is Vic Bangio's defense, man. It's like communication. I don't want any young corner out there. We saw young corners playing last year. It ain't good. There's blown coverages all over the place. Am I the only one in Philadelphia that wants to see James Bradbury with Vic Banjo? Because I think he's going to have a bounce back year because we he's so him. smart. Vic's yeah. going to use him right. He was never about athleticism to begin with. He's not a speed guy. He's a pure zone coverage corner. Whereas if you bring in even Terry and Ar Arnold, who visited with the Eagles yesterday, 
and cool it, uh, cool it. All these great athletes, Quinion Mitchell, for some reason, he's not going to fall, but if he does, they're going to make a lot of mistakes in coverage in this, this, this defensive scheme. Um, at least early. Now you might get through it and they might turn into superstars and that's what you're weighing. Any concerns over the complicated nature of this defense with a young first round corner? A lot. There's a lot for any defensive back because you got, you, you, everybody has to be on that same page and it, seeing a couple old Vic uh, playbooks. It's, it's pretty intense. Oh, it's pretty yeah. like looking around like, okay, you gotta go. Okay. There's a motion. And then all of a sudden you got the communication you're doing this way. And you're like, especially coming in the league. Like if you're used to playing like band where it's like, okay, man, man cover, like, not that many different variations. It can be a lot. So I always say there's going to be a, a good few corners, no matter where you're picking. So if you hold off till next year and try to do that, maybe if you get a, that, I just think right now, if you try to force somebody in there, like say Cooper DeJean or, or Kool-Aid McKinstry or somebody like that for it, it's going to be tough. I think Bradbury is going to actually have a bounce back year. 2021 before he was with the Giants at one of his worst seasons statistically. Actually, you know, he's an all pro guy too. And as much as Vic likes to use that cover six where he, where I think Bradbury's a better zone guy as well too, you go like at a quarter, quarter, half, I think he can excel on that. So it, it, with Vic, with Vic leading it as opposed to say decide, I think this, as opposed to decide. So for one year, you ride it out. You still have a lot of other depth pieces like Eli Ricks. You still got. They uh, already have a lot yeah, of good Kelly, Kelly Ringo too. So yeah, you got that stuff. Yeah. So yeah, go, yeah, I think you can roll with them, and then uh, you can always go out and sign some people as well too. Like after June first, so I think there's a lot. Hey, this OTA is going to be big. Put it that way. I I agree, Chris. Last question for me: uh, Sixers or Heat tonight? Who do you got? Oh, Sixers. Sixers, Damn and right. they go to the I go to the Eastern Conference Finals this year. I really think. Oh that, oh. I'm calling Chris, it I'm calling oh. it Eastern Conference Finals. Jimmy, They're Jimmy, uh, uh, <laughs> wait, hold on. Who's, who's they're not losing the Celtics or, or, or losing the, Celtics. Uh, the Celtics are beat them in the next conference. I think Celtics oh, yeah. going to, uh, we know to the finals. I, I've seen Celtics this movie. Uh, <laughs> they've avoided, finals, man. they've avoided the uh Celtics, right? So until the yeah, if they win tonight, they do. If they, if they're the eight seed. <laughs> Oh no! If they're the eight, they have to win tonight. And by the yeah, way, playoff win. playoff Jimmy Butler. There's no guarantee that's going to be a win tonight. Well, <laughs> playoff Jimmy lost last year, first play in game, and then won the second. Yeah, and then they went. And the then they no. went to the Eastern. Yeah, they went to the NBA Finals. Yeah, the uh, NBA Finals. Excuse me. Yeah, it's NBA. a better rotation with the Sixers too. I, I, it's like it's a little bit deeper than last but, year, and you but, don't have but, Doc Rivers coaching them too, so that helps out too. That's a plus. There we Sixers, go. Yeah, <laughs> tell me, there we go. Tell me if the big guy's going to play every day. If it's going to be one of those situations, oh, yeah. even if they win the play play in game, yeah. Is he going to play game one and not play game two? And you know, if he's out there. Everybody. They'll, 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 yeah. they'll make a run. He'll be every day. He'll be everyday guy. Like he, he did this with 21, 22. Yeah. He'll be the everyday guy. He'll be good. The, the Celtics yeah. are the, the bane of the Sixers existence and will continue to be. Just like the eighties again. Huh? Yeah. Is this the Feels, like it. Feels like it. Feels like it. Feels like it. No, because 1980 was a good rivalry. Yeah. Now they the won. Celtics, yeah. <laughs> now the Celtics just beat them like a drum. Uh, yeah, the Sixers it's, it's, won occasionally in that one. Yeah. Uh, hey, who knows? Maybe this is their 80 year. Maybe this is their 1983 year or whatever. Uh, 82, Chris, 83. It's they owe us one for sure. That's for sure. They owe us one. They do owe us one. Hell yeah. <laughs> Hell yeah. Uh, Chris, thanks so much, brother. Great catch up with you, man. Make sure you guys are reading all Chris has to offer there, of course, on NJ.com. Chris, thanks so much. Thanks, guys. Have a good one now. Thanks, uh, bud. You as well, Chris Franklin, joining us. All right, coming up. Uh, John, I, I did need to ask you an honor of Howie Roseman's snippiness uh, when we put a bow on the show here coming up in a second. You ever got into it with a uh, with a subject in a press conference? And, and, and how did you respond? I want to ask you that question coming up in a few here on Birds 365.
Imagine for a moment that you went to work today and when you came home, you were catastrophically injured. Your life and your family's life. That's what happened to union construction worker Mike Little. I was scared of what the end was going to be, but to be 100% honest with you, I knew I was going to be all right just by talking with Brian. In my heart, I just knew everything was going to be all right. Call the firm and find out why they say, we got this. Call 215-458-2222. Field of life. First Trust Bank is there for you. Because Philadelphia dreams deserve a Philadelphia bank. Underdog Fantasy is the easiest place to play fantasy sports and certainly the easiest when you're watching the NBA and the NBA playoffs are almost here and you can win money making picks. What are you waiting for? Sign up on underdogfantasy.com and use the promo code WIN. An underdog will double your first deposit up to $100. That's underdogfantasy.com. Use the promo code WIN. Get ready for the NBA and get ready for the NBA playoffs. Go to underdogfantasy.com. Use the promo code WIN. Hi everybody, my name is Jason Lombardi. I'm an inspector at DryTech. At DryTech we offer three major services. The first one being basement waterproofing. The second service we offer is foundation and structural repairs. And then the third service that we offer is mold remediation. If you feel you are having a waterproofing issue, give DryTech a call or check us out online. Do you stream on a Roku, Fire Stick, Google TV, or Apple TV? Now you can watch 6ABC 24-7 with the 6ABC Philadelphia streaming app. And the big story on Action News. Search 6ABC <laughs> Philadelphia and start streaming today. E-A-G-L-E-S. Eagles. Welcome back, Birds 365. Mark Farzetta. John McMullen. John, you ever get in a little uh, back and forth in a press oh, conference? You ever, you ever have a slugfest? Too many to count, I think. Uh, you, press conference, it's more individual, I would say. Press conference, yeah, there's some awkward moments. Probably my most awkward moment was when I asked Doug Peterson about the butterfly effect, and Doug had no freaking idea what I was talking about. <laughs> but, but, but it wasn't any, you know, angst. snarkiness. Yeah. Right. He was like, he had no idea what it meant. And I'm like, really? I, 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 all right. We're going to have to have that discussion off mm. the podium. A lot of, you know, Nelson Aguilar really got heated at me once. Um, Doug really got heated in, in an off the record. Um, that was at a group of us. Um, so there's been a lot over, over the years, but in press conferences, more just awkward when people don't understand what you're asking. Um, snippy. Yeah. How he gets snippy with me occasionally. Um, but nothing overt, no, nothing crazy, nothing mm -hmm. crazy. I, I would say Nelson, Nelson wanted to beat me up. So. <laughs> That was uh what'd you ask Nelly? Hey Nelly, why I, are you I, terrible? I, I, <laughs> now all, all I said it, it had to do with it at the time they traded for Golden Tate. And by the way, Nelson was right, and Nelson and I have since made up. Mm -hmm. uh, Nelson's a very good guy, but I said, you know, Golden Tate when the Eagles acquired him was a pretty successful player. If people are in, it didn't work out yeah. here, but he had a, some good years, and I I just basically wrote something that he should be the slot receiver. And Nelson did not take it well. And by the way, the, the he was right because Golden didn't have much left. And not that Nelson was great, but he had a great Super Bowl. Um, I will say that. Um, but the Eagles kept playing him. And I said, why? Why are you trading for Golden Tate? And 
you keep playing Nelson Aguilar. And basically they saw the two in practice and made the right decision. But that was my immediate reaction was, well, you traded for the guy, play him. Um, and Nelson took issue with that. Uh, gotcha. Yeah. The, the, the press conference can always be really awkward because you don't want to take other people's time too. No, like, no, like, I don't like, care like, about those other people. So yeah. <laughs> now um, you're, you're right in that, but it can be more awkward when the, especially when somebody doesn't understand what you're asking. Right. Um, then it yeah. becomes a little bit awkward. I got a glare from Doug Peterson after the NFC championship game against the the vikings because he was like we don't listen to outside noise none of that matters blah blah and in the meantime lane johnson is walking around in a dog mask all right so they heard the outside so i just i, I don't know why but i knew there was more to the answer that than he was giving so i just said doug you don't you, you say you don't hear the outside noise but lane's walking around in a dog mask a number of your players are so the underdog thing matters you know, why, why, why belittle that motivation, which has clearly been motivation for you guys. He glared at me as if I just lined up his most loved family members and punched them all in the face. Yeah. And then he said, when did we lose uh, Carson Wentz? And I was like, Oh God, now he wants to get into it. And then Les jumped in and Les went uh, December 12th or whatever it was. And he's like, since then no one. And then he gave the most beautiful answer yeah. about people doubting them. And I'm like, see, that that was there. That yeah. was there. And Andy Reid shot me. And, 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 and yeah, um, now that you bring that up, underdog, I once, you know, Nick was, I said, you're literally never the underdog. You know, Kelsey has the underdog uh, uh, where, you know, his own company, the hat, and Nick was wearing. Sure. And I told him one day, you know, you haven't been the underdog in like 28 games at the time. <laughs> and yeah, he didn't take that well. <laughs> I, I remember that. I remember that being like, oh, damn, man. He's bragging for you. Take the compliment, bro. Yeah, exactly. Take the, take the compliment. You're never the underdog. Uh, John, such a pleasure as always, man, to catch up with you, brother. It's good to sit in with you. I think I'll be back with you on Friday. I think you yeah. and I are hanging out again. Friday, so look uh, yeah, and we already got Rick, we're going to have a draft guy on Friday, Rick Saratella. Uh, oh yeah, 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 oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Damo is. We'll see. I'll try to lock Damo in. I believe he's going to be our H twenty guest. But yeah, we'll have a fun time, Mark. Great, big fan of uh, Paul Domowich. Uh What time is the Jalen Hurts press conference? I haven't I haven't gotten a time yet. Uh, it is, let me check. It is, and it will be Jalen Hurts and some other players today. Um, they just started off season work between 11 and 1130. So basically I'm running down here as soon as I get off with you. Running well, down. in that case, it's been fun. All right. I'll talk to you on Friday, my friend. Thanks, bud. John McMullen, Mark Farzetta, Birds 365 here on the Jacob Media Sports Channel. You've been listening to Birds 365, the destination for the passionate Eagles football fan who bleeds green. If it's Eagles football, we're talking about it. Debate inside the locker room and guests that are some of the greatest football minds from around the region. We hope you enjoyed the show. We know we had a blast. Make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. And we'll be back soon. But in the meantime, hook up with us on social media at Jacob Sports. See you next time on Birds 365.